109. We there. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived. Oh, sorry. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain, for he had been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what uh, those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Great. Okay. Um Well, good morning, everybody. Let's have a look at this uh, this passage then in Mark chapter five. The healing of a demon possessed uh, man is the title in in our Bibles. Um, there's a line in the Lord's Prayer um, which goes, uh, "Lead us not into temptation." <coughs> yes, but deliver us from evil, Lord. Deliver us from evil. Maybe you were taught the Lord's Prayer. Maybe it was at primary school. I think that's probably where I learned it. Um, or maybe you went along to Sunday school or something, and you might have learnt learnt it there. Um, I th- I'm sure I'd always thought, when I thought about that uh, particular line, I'd always thought it was about evil out there. Deliver us from evil out there. But later I came to realise it was talking about the evil in here. Uh, Lead us not into temptation, and by so doing, deliver us from evil. Yeah, about the evil in here. Jesus taught us how to pray there in that Lord's Prayer in ten lines. And two of those lines, in other words, one-fifth of that prayer concerns being delivered from evil within. Um. And I had to ask myself this week, how often does that make it into my prayers? Um, what experience do you have of, of that fear of the evil within, as it were, and a desperate need to be delivered from it, as Jesus has expressed in, in the Lord's Prayer itself? Um, just to tell you a story for myself, in recent months, um, I was so conscious at one point of my own battle against, at that particular point, 
an ungodly thought and desire. I was so conscious, uh, conscious of it, um, and I was so struggling with the battle within that I that I wrote out by hand um, significant portions of Proverbs one, two, five, seven, eight, and nine. They're here, actually, on this piece of paper. I still got it, um, and I repeated them over and over. And I try to battle those ungodly feelings and desires by praying the truths of these bits from Proverbs in. Um, And I carried this wadge of paper around with me for days so that I could pull it out of the pocket um, when that sense came upon me again, that that, that feeling, that that, uh, that temptation. Um, And I have to tell you, I seemed often to be losing the battle. Um, uh, And... uh, I think in many ways I did lose the battle many times, as it were. And this was a desperate attempt in those moments to to turn to something that would help. Um, I lost the battle often because the evil that I wanted, um, that wanted me, was just so desirable to me. That's the thing about it, isn't it? It was so desirable. Um, See, evil doesn't come um, to us wearing tights uh, and red horns and a forked tail, actually, does it? We know that. It comes to us and it whispers desirable, sweet nothings in our ear. Evil doesn't seem evil because it's pleasurable. Um, So there are times when greed, (laughs) greed doesn't seem evil to you and me. when sexual immorality doesn't seem evil to you and me, when abuse rather than use of some sub- substance or some good thing that the Lord has given, it doesn't seem so evil, when unforgiveness um, or gossip or lying or laziness doesn't seem so evil. And we all know that we live, the, the, the world that we live in, the culture that we live in, um, you know, just, just doesn't call bad bad any longer either, does it? It doesn't really have a category for, for, for evil, as it were, in that way. Um, things that are wrong are more likely to be called right these days, aren't they? And things that are right are more likely to be called uh, wrong. Um, and the only thing that's evil it seems these days is the person who refuses to agree with the view of the person next to them uh, the person who is intolerant um, so all of this means that we desperately need a word of wisdom and honesty about the evil of evil which is what we have here today a disturbing picture of what happens when evil takes control of a person uh, as a warning, as a warning of the evil of evil. Um, I'm, I'm afraid there's nothing humorous uh, about this story today, um, nothing very light-hearted about it in any way. But hang on in the story. Can I plead with you? Hang on in the story because Jesus is going to put a smile on your face. He's going to put a smile on your face in the midst of this this difficult story and dark story. When we see him, the strong man, um, the warrior, uh, enter in to deal with the root cause of evil and sin and our fallen human nature. So let me read again uh, what we've had read already. But let's just uh, read from the from the beginning some of this story from verse uh, one of chapter five. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. The man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? 
Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission. And the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. It seems unfamiliar, doesn't it? What are we looking at here? Let's deal with this question first of all. We like to put medical labels on things that are alien and unfamiliar to us. Um, So maybe uh, right at the moment you're you're, you're thinking like that. Um, After all, we know people, many people like this guy, who are either a danger to themselves and probably also a danger to people around them. we know that they exist in, 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 even in our community um, today. And we'd hardly refer to them as possessing an evil spirit, would we? Um, so in our minds, and when we read a story like this, we want to call it kind of maybe it's a, a case of um, a misdiagnosis of somebody who was re- is really suffering from a mental illness, but you know, back in those days, they didn't have the categories for it. That's perhaps sometimes how we like to think about this, isn't it? Um, accept, accept that there's something, that isn't there something deeply disturbing and supernatural about this incident, which just doesn't go away easily like that, does it? It doesn't actually satisfy. And in any case, the Gospels make a distinction between mental illness and conditions and those kinds of things and demonic possession that we're looking at here or the possession of evil spirits. Um, If you're making notes, Matthew chapter 4, you'll see that in. Um, Now, the fact that this unusual kind of expose of evil here just proves that Jesus is the self-proclaimed stronger man who's come to bind Satan. Um, Because you'd expect, wouldn't you, if that was the case, an intensifying of demonic activity um, in that time and that place, that Jesus has come to do that. Now, I'm going to say that we need to accept the plain meaning and the plain reading when it says a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. And when we do, there are four things that uh, stand out and show us um, this man's, through the man's story, um, the evil of evil, as it were, sheds light on on this. And uh, Joe, you've got got some slides, you put some headings up. Let's have a look at this. Four things to show. First of all, evil robs you of your humanity. Evil robs you of your humanity. Um, Don't you think that the way that this man is described in Mark chapter 5 is more fitting of a ferocious animal than a human being? Uh, The efforts to get him on a leash that we've got there, haven't we, in chains. How he lives in cavern-like tombs. Um, and he's crying out, he's howling as it were. It's all described in those terms, aren't they? Um, almost like, like an animal. Another, of, another gospel, when it recounts this story, tells us he's naked. I, I imagine him scrambling around on all fours. Do you? Don't know. Do you get that kind of picture? A kind of golem like figure from the Lord of the Rings, but less fictional um, and more soberingly real and tragic. Yeah. Um, evil has it in practice as its goal this dehumanizing effect um, turning human beings made in the image of God with all the dignity that that suggests made in the image of God human beings uh, into mere animal like creatures um, and it would be foolish to think that human beings must be demonized 
to descend into the degradation of the beast man before us here because I reckon we've almost all of us certainly seen this kind of dehumanizing effect in other people in other people um, and we may with wisdom and honesty um, have seen it in ourselves at times in ourselves because you see the truth is that evil robs us of our humanity um, but the second thing evil is always evil is always self-destructive evil is never ever your friend whatever it promises is always always a lie evil never wants anything that is good for you it only ever and always wants what is bad and this man is as tragic as he is frightening isn't he I mean, don't you feel enormous pity for him too? Think of his mother and father. Um, Think of his brothers and sisters, if he had them. Um, Think of what he'd been. Think um, of how he'd once been a boy uh, or a young man with friends, maybe. Um, That he'd once been part of a family or a community and he's now utterly isolated living among the filth, um, in vermin-infested tomb caverns, and an, an insomniac, eerily crying out day and night, cutting himself, it says, so that his once healthy young skin is now lacerated with cuts and sores. Here for us, God in his grace and his mercy gives us a picture of where evil always goes. Have you noticed that we've got this perverse ability to look on evil and yet not see evil? If I'm greedy and I spend more on myself than I should, it doesn't seem so evil because it's just so pleasant. I get a buzz from that purchase, whatever it might be. If I abuse alcohol or some other substance, it doesn't seem evil because it's pleasurable. And I get that momentary buzz or hit. If I'm looking at pornography or something, it doesn't seem evil because it's so pleasurable at that moment. If I'm gossiping or bad-mouthing someone, I get the buzz from the feeling of superiority that it gives gives me. If I'm harboring unforgiveness, it doesn't feel evil because it's it's, it stops me being hurt and it puts me in control of a situation. You see how difficult it is. So we need pictures um, like this to peel back the layers and show us what's actually going on. Uh, the destructiveness of evil. And the fate of the herd of pigs shows evil's ultimate aim is to kill and destroy um, I, mean, I think that the fate of the pigs shows us uh, what the demons would have done to the man given the time. It says the herd, about 2,000 in number, reading from verse 13, the herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. I don't know if you're here this morning, maybe you're thinking, well, I'm, I'm a pretty decent person. Um, nothing like this unfortunate guy. This is not me at all. Um, sure, I'm not, I'm not a saint, um, but I've, uh, I've got plenty of good things that I've done. And if you weigh those in the balance with some of the bad things I'm aware of, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to be okay. Um, it gives me no pleasure to, to remind us of this, but the Bible is clear. Um, without the entering in of Jesus Christ... God's mercy and power in your life, that evil that seems so pleasurable, will, given time, meet its full destructive end in another lake, uncomfortably called the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20 says, the lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Stay with me, folks. Okay, there's something glorious to come. We've got to see this. 
This is appealing back so that we can see the glorious thing to come. Uh, Thirdly, evil is always against God. There's never anything harmless about evil where God's concerned. We might kid ourselves, for example, that God isn't really all that bothered about any of this. Um, And what, what, yeah, what God calls evil, we're more likely to excuse of as being a bit of a bit of harmless fun, a bit of vice. But evil personified here is an outrageous act of disrespect and sass against God. Um, Just look what he shouts out loud. It says he shouts out loud in verse 7. What do you want with me, Jesus? Or as, as the original translation puts it, what have you to do with me? What have you to do with me? There's this strange mix, isn't there? As the man is thrown down, kneeling before Jesus, and then evil is shouting out this kind of outrageous, um, sassy disrespect. Um, and, and then he even goes on to say, swear to God that you won't torture me. Swear to God. This is the, it's, it's, that's a barefaced cheek, isn't it? Coming from the one, one who is evil to, to the one who is the son of the most high God. He's commanding him. The spirit is commanding him, swear to God. Barefaced cheek. So the picture that we've got here is this man is, is thrown down in front of Jesus. is isn't worship. We see evil personified coming out of this man. It's not worship. This is pure strut. This is copying an attitude big time. Before we ever kid ourselves that evil is harmless, and we're pretty good really, the plain lesson here is that evil is always against God. And then the fourth thing to notice, that evil can't be contained by anything in this world. Did you see that at the beginning of the story? A couple of sentences uh, used to, to tell us that. The man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot. But he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Those irons to try to contain. Perhaps it began as, began as a kindness to the man. Maybe they would try to bind him in order to keep him clean for long enough that he might come to his senses. Maybe that's how it started. Um, inevitably and invariably it became a way to keep those who had the misfortune of living near him safe from him. Um, At some point or other, it obviously became that. We don't know exactly. But we are told that twice that no one could bind him. No one could subdue him. Not even with chains and shackles, which he broke to pieces. It's a powerful lesson, isn't it, right before us? That there is nothing in the world that can possibly flatten, contain, subdue, conquer evil. Not one thing in this world that can do that evil that is that self-destructive such that everything that happened to the pigs is a picture of what it does to a person ultimately can never be conquered apart from the intervention of god the breaking in from outside of something out of this world and it's no wonder then that jesus says we should pray it's going back to how we started deliver us from evil Do you know, Mark spends three quarters of these verses cataloging for us the evil of evil. We ought to be afraid of evil. Um, I reckon messages like this are difficult for us to hear because uh, we're not most of the time, are we? We don't really give that much thought. We ought to be afraid of the evil of evil. But even as I say that, we ought more to tremble with joy and fear when we see now what Jesus does here. Okay? And this, folks, is glorious. So I've got my smile on here. Okay? This is glorious. And we should too. In fact, I'm going to take a swig of drink first before we have looked at. Because you can't miss this. Okay? 
And the first thing we've got to see is that Jesus is staging effectively a hostage release in enemy territory here. Okay, you might not have seen that, but if we were to read it through this story through with the eyes of the first readers, we'd see how that really stands out. Um, Even though it's a little bit lost on us, this is enemy territory, guys. Um, Mention of the location, first of all, uh, it's the region of the Gerasenes. Um, uh, Then there's mention of living among the tombs. Um, There's mention in the story of pigs and of herdsmen. Um, Now, all of those things, to the original readers, which is a bit lost on us, would have said, unclean, unclean, unclean. Uh, Enemy territory, enemy territory. Put simply, all these details in the story remind us, or to show us, or to shout out to us, that what we've got here in terms of location and situation is the absolute opposite of godliness, um, in the eyes of those original readers. So, so here, if you like, is a man. Here is Jesus, a man facing an unclean spirit, living among unclean tombs, surrounded by people who are engaged in an unclean occupation, all in an unclean Gentile territory. And that would have shouted out really loud. So if you want a picture in your mind, this is the equivalent of like, if you like Lord of the Rings, this is like Mordor. Okay, do you remember like Mordor, where Sauron was? This is the this is the absolute evil enemy territory where this is taking place. Okay, we've got to see that first of all. It's really great to remember that that's where Jesus comes right into that situation. Okay, now then, the, there's the opponent. Okay, what's the opponent like before before Jesus? Well, in the if it was a boxing match, we'd have in the blue corner Jesus, uh, and in the red corner Legion. Legion. What does it make you think of when you hear that word legion? Probably if you've done the Romans at school, you'll think of a Roman legion, okay, uh, of about a regiment, about 6,000 soldiers. Um, and, and, and you think about the Romans, what you know about the Romans, even from school. They were, they were, um, they were highly efficient, weren't they? They were a force to be reckoned with. They were sadistically brutal. Um, they were single-minded in their conquering intent. Their straight roads are a picture of their single-mindedness, aren't they? They are going forward and nobody is going to stop them. Okay. So when, when we hear that word legion, that's, 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 uh, that should instill in us a great sense of uh, fear um, or the, uh, uh, at the size of the opponent facing Jesus here. Um, the sheer number and the power and the intention of Jesus' opponent legion evil in front of him so the pre-fight weigh-in if you like that we're given here looks well against jesus's favor it looks like a flyweight has been drawn against the heavyweight okay that's the picture we're supposed to see and then we've got the trash talk um that's the boxing thing that they uh, the expression used for that little bit of talk before the fight you know the trash talk um and legion is shouting loud and sassy at jesus we've already seen that haven't we are we shouting loud and sassy and then the bell goes and the contest begins and do you know it's over in a moment in fact you could say there is no contest in fact, we're not even giving it actually are we you won't find it there it's over flattened jesus flattens him the enemy in his territory on his own turf in fact all we see we go from verse 9 where all this build-up happens to verse 10 and in verse 10 we just see we just see evil begging jesus not to send it out of the area and you to see guys and this should make us smile jesus has complete complete and utter control over evil the story ends with the herdsman running back to the town and the countryside to report what had happened and uh, you can just imagine the mixture of emotions as they explain that the crazy man or who had been crazy was now in his right mind and uh, and at the same time how 200 pigs had ended up rushing down the steep bank and uh, floating out to sea. And then in the story, Mark zooms in in his story writing on a, on a man. He zooms in in the story on a man who's sitting. He's just sitting there like a, 
Like, you're just sitting there at the moment, Tommy. Just sitting there, the bloke. Okay? Wearing clothes, looking and behaving like a normal human being. Who is this man? Who is this man? Why, it's the man who's been possessed, who had been possessed by the legion of demons. <laughs> and look what it says in verse 15. When they, the townspeople, came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. Isn't that just the best verse in the whole story? <laughs> Isn't it great that Mark reminds us again, oh, by the way, this man, this is the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons, sitting there, dressed, and in his right mind. Isn't that just the best verse? Isn't that just the best picture that we've got there? That's the, that, folks, that's the defining picture this morning of grace. Um, and of rescue and of deliverance from evil by Jesus Christ. Jesus uh, says to the man, see, he says to the man, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And if you're a Christian here this morning, that man's story is your story. How much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. Lord, you've done great things for me. You have confronted the evil nature that I was enslaved to. At the cross, you stormed the enemy's territory. You shattered the enemy's control over me. You broke me out from under the destructive power of Satan and evil. And Lord, you've given me a new control center. And you've set about restoring the image of God in me. And although that war will continue to rage on this side of the new creation, so that I don't do the good that I want to do, but the evil I don't want to do, that I do, Although that's going to carry on, you have, Lord, nevertheless, decisively dealt sin, Satan and death, the decisive blow at the cross, so that evil will not finally finish me. We can say, praise God for that. Praise God for that. And maybe you've seen the evil of evil today in the story and you desperately want Jesus to break you out and I want you to see here this morning that he is able to do that wasn't it easy for him wasn't it easy for him no contest you may think I'm I'm too bad for that you need to see that he specializes in away wins he does better when he's away than at home. He specializes in the really difficult. He never, ever, ever loses. You need to know that. But there's a detail at the end of the story that Mark doesn't want us to miss. And so where we finish, in verse 17, the townspeople, did you notice, began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. The townspeople began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. Having Jesus around, it seems, was kind of bad for business. It interfered with their business, having Jesus around. It's a bit of a danger if somebody's around and and 200 pigs end up in in the swim. Perhaps there's times for all of us when we'd rather have our little moments of evil than rescuing grace. Perhaps there are times when we'd all say in our own subtle way, please leave. Because right now this evil is making me happy. Is there a place in your life where rescuing grace is in the way of what you call happiness? Here's another kindness of God to warn us that in the face of the horror of evil... 
and the glorious grace and mercy and power of Christ, people would still say, it seems, please leave. Please leave Jesus. And it's just a reminder, isn't it, that we need grace, even to desire grace and rescue in our moments of the need of grace. We need grace even to desire grace in our moment of a need of grace. But the great news here this morning, folks, is that grace is found in Jesus Christ in abundance. Grace unmeasured, boundless, free. In Christ, the one and only Son. We're at the beginning of Advent here, aren't we, really? Remember in how John describes Jesus at the beginning of his gospel? And says that Jesus is the one who, uh, uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace. Full of abounding grace. uh, Full of abounding grace and truth. So thank you for hanging with me there. We've seen the evil of evil. But we've seen a wonderful conquering, victorious, rescuing grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in the middle of it. We're going to sing about that wonderful, um, unmeasured, vast and free grace in a moment. But first of all, as the musicians come up, we'll pray. We'll ask them to come up. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. As we think about this picture here that we've just had. Let me read verse 15 uh, for our prayer. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this picture of rescuing grace. Uh, We pray that you would help us um, as we take this part of Mark's Gospel out into our week to think rightly about it. We pray that you would help us as we meditate on this picture of evil. Um, Lord, help us as we do that to hate evil all the more. Um, And give us hearts that just overflow with thankfulness that you've broken the power of evil over us. Thank you that there is no evil that Christ cannot and has not defeated at the cross. Holy Spirit, help us in temptation and deliver us from evil. And help us, like the man at the end of the story, to beg to be with Jesus. Deliver us from all the subtle ways in which we say to Jesus, please leave. Lord, throw a spotlight on those we pray. And help us to see that in that rescuing, redeeming grace, you have given us the power as we look ahead to the day when we will finally, evil will be finally and fully and completely seen to be defeated and gone. So help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand together and sing then gladly about this unbounding, vast and free grace.